Welcome to a second in a series of videos on par parallel chord truss geometry. The first video dealt with square bays and rectangular bays. This one is dealing with something called the Warren configuration and the modified Warren configuration. And we're again, we're going to talk about materials, member cross sections, web patterns, and connection methods. This is the most basic Warren truss configuration. It's named after a person named Warren who explored it and uh, defined it. It's basically a series of triangles which are uh, typically roughly equilateral, but they can uh, vary substantially. Um, it's pretty easy to remember because uh, these webs create a pattern of W's, which is reminiscent of the first letter of Warren's name. Now, uh, in the case of square trusses, we talked about the advantages of um, keeping the vertical and the diagonals because the verticals would be shorter and less vulnerable to buckling. In the case of the Warren truss, all the members are of the same length. So as a kind of symbolic recognition, I've shown the tension members uh, slightly thinner, the compression members slightly fatter, and then tension thinner, compression fatter, and so forth. Um, as a sort of expression of how one might approach dealing with a Warren truss. But it turns out there are lots of configurations we might use where we can make this one inherently fat and for the same price we make that one inherently fat because we make them out of, for example, the same size tube. So here we have uh, wood top and bottom cords in this truss and the web members are made out of hollow steel tube and because uh, steel is a very stiff very strong material and because we've made these hollow tubes to help them resist buckling it turns out that they work really well in this Warren truss geometry even though some of these members are fairly long they're also uh, reasonably stout in terms of resisting compression we can find uh, cases or examples that are beautifully uh, articulated in terms of the, the importance of various kinds of forces. This is the Pompidou Museum in Paris. And basically this building was designed on the premise. And by the way, it was designed by Richard Rogers and Renzo Piano. And it was designed on the premise that every technological system was going to be expressed. So all the ductwork, all the mechanical system, all the structure is expressed. And it's not just expressed in, may, in terms of being made visually apparent, but it's expressed in the sense that every truss is like a structural diagram that tells you what's going on at, in, within that truss. So here we have a tension member, which is rendered in this case as a double tube which becomes a double bottom cord we have a double top cord but the rest of these web members are, are articulated in a way that expresses their function so for example here we have a member in fairly high compression it's rendered as a large diameter tube um, to express the notion that um, it's in compression and needs to be made given some substantial breadth to help it resist uh, buckling. This member, on the other hand, is rendered as a fairly slender tube, which is expressive of the fact that it has tension in it. So we have fat for compression, slender for tension, fat for compression, and so forth. And as we get closer to the center of the truss, all the members get smaller in dimension, expressing the fact that web forces tend to be relatively small near the middle. On the other hand, cord forces are large near the middle and these trusses express that variation also. And I'm 
I'm puzzled because I'm missing a crucial slide here, but I think you can kind of see it here that this member on the bottom cord has a certain dimension and it tapers upward and gets larger just before it gets to this joint and in the next bay it's larger and then the next bay down it's even larger and we have a similar phenomena here with the top cord members. Now uh, not all Warren trusses necessarily have fat compression members. Sometimes the forces involved are so small that even though we haven't picked the optimal geometry uh, in picking the uh, Warren truss, uh, the members still end up being stout enough and having enough breadth that they'll work. So for example, in this roof, we have some major structure here. We have more structure along this line. And then this truss is just supporting the amount of glass from here up to the truss and then halfway down to the next support point. And this happens to be in Portland where um, even though it's fairly northerly, um, it's a very moderate climate because of the winds off the Pacific Ocean. So they have very little snow. There's very little load on this truss. And in designing the truss, they've designed it to be as simple as possible to fabricate. So in this case, the web members are all angles. And the angles are notched at the end so that the only thing passing into the space between the two top cord members, this member and that, both of which are aluminum angles also, um, only half the angle goes between them. Uh, so this remaining leg here is not truly active in terms of resisting force in the web members. It's just acting in terms of resisting buckling in this leg. And this leg is basically carrying all of that force. And in fact, not only is a single angle not really great in terms of having lots of breadth for resisting buckling, but in this case, the load is eccentric because it's on one side of the angle. And what we learned in columns is that if we have eccentric load, we induce bending stresses in that compression member. In spite of all the problems from that and from the fact that these two members aren't even on the center line of the structure, from all of that, we still get very successful performance out of this system, which is very easy to fabricate and we do so because the loads are not very high and we can tolerate some of these inefficiencies in the shapes of the members and the the detailing of the joints. Alright, so this is our basic Warren truss geometry and this is something that we in our textbook refer to as a modified Warren truss. Um, it, it basically takes the the standard W and adds a vertical. This vertical provides a support for the gravity loads on a portion of the top cord. So the top cord is in bending and wants to sag downward and this little strut becomes like a column that just helps support the load between that point and that point and it actually is supporting the top cord between right there and right there. So it's not a very large load but this member is profoundly beneficial in terms of taking bending out of that top cord. It's also beneficial because it braces the top cord at mid-span. Uh, so we don't get a buckling pattern where the top cord goes down here and up there and down there. So the top cord is in both bending and compression, which, which under gravity load is a much more severe condition than for the bottom cord which is in pure tension. Now under wind suction, we do have to worry uh, because some compression will go into this bottom cord and we need to make sure that bottom cord works well enough under whatever that net suction is so that we don't end up with buckling of the bottom cord. Otherwise, the wind will suck the building up, the bottom cord will buckle, and, and the roof will be torn away um, and fail. But nonetheless, in many environments, 
The gravity load is the dominant load, and these elements help the top cord under gravity load in both resisting buckling and, and reducing the bending stress that would exist where the top cord was spanning from there to there instead of from there to there and there to there. Uh, leaving the strut out on the bottom, by the way, offers the opportunity to run ducts through these larger voids. So it's a very appealing geometry. Again, we're calling this the mo modified Warren truss. And this is an example of such a structure. Um, here you see the primary W elements are double angles. Those individual struts, as we said, are not really part of the overall truss action. They're not working at any joint to alter the forces in any of the web members. So they're not primary members. They're just there to support this little segment of roof here um, against the gravity load on it and to help brace the top cord against buckling. Um, so you'll notice these verticals are rendered as single angles which have mashed ends and they are sandwiched between the two double angles of the top cord and the two double angles of the bottom cord. And by the way, the drawing, the image gets a little confusing because there's a member right here and a member right there. Those are out of the plane of the truss and they are bracing members to keep the truss from moving horizontally. And all these examples we're using so far are examples of planar trusses the planar trusses tend to be laterally unstable and they need periodic bracing to keep them from snapping from side to side. All right, so there is a, a classic example of a modified um, Warren truss and you'll notice the duct that we referred to here. In this case, it's not running through center span, but near the end. But basically these larger open triangles afford the opportunity to run ductwork of that sort. This is just another view. It shows the mashed ends of this single angle. So this single angle is what actually uh, assures the spacing between the two top cord uh, angles and the two bottom cord angles. Um, and it's mashed, by the way, in every case to be a standard one inch across. So the dimension of this angle is along from the outer leg to outer leg is probably about two and a half inches, but once the end is mashed, it's substantially less than that. You'll notice the members that are in tension are fairly light double angles. Uh, the ones in compression have longer legs and they are also welded together with cross members, which are welded in such a way that you get a little moment connection there, which allows these angles to work together in terms of resisting buckling. Now, if we want to subdivide the support of the top cord even more, in addition to this vertical, we can add two more. And I'm referring to these as fan trusses because all these web members appear to form a kind of fan shape. Um, and this is what a structure like that might look like. Um, and it tends to be something that we use on very deep trusses uh, for fairly long spans and we need to subdivide the top cords fairly finely. Now another way that we can subdivide the top cord uh, is to take this basic uh, modified Warren truss. So here we have our, our, our true uh, truss elements and then we have these verticals and we can subdivide the top cord with another vertical there and a diagonal there and a diagonal and a vertical there and it looks something like this. And the idea is that this vertical strut, which is supporting a small segment of the top cord, is stabilized by a sling consisting of the upper part of this member working together with this new additional member. So this sling supports this compression strut, which supports that portion of this top cord. Again, this is a very fine subdivision that we would never go to uh, on a, on a um, 
structure of this short span. So I should have rendered these people as like that tall so that you would understand that we're, we're not subdividing this truss down into uh, 18 inch segments, but maybe more like 18 feet. If this were the span across a football stadium or a basketball stadium. Um, it's a very elegant kind of uh, theme uh, where this geometry with that strut is being mimicked at a smaller scale. Um, this is like music where you have uh, some chord and then a harmonic of that chord that blends in with it and is richer. Um, we also refer to this as... Um, as being um, as exhibiting similar properties at uh, closer scrutiny as you see at a more global scale and uh, there are a lot of uh, beautiful examples of this in Mendelbrot mathematics but also in the things uh, the self-similarity that we see in things like the antennas in cell phones. We used to have antennas where on a building you'd see dozens of different sizes and styles of antenna, each of which was designed to react to a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum depending on the frequency. And now you're able to handle huge bandwidths and many different frequencies in a cell phone that you can hand, carry around in your hand and it's because of this property of self-similarity that allows that to work. Okay, so another little odd quirk which we often introduce in the geometry of trusses is at the end of the truss we also often want a fairly shallow member because we would like that member to, in a fairly small end-bearing assembly, to be able to get to the center line of the vertical support element. And so a shallow member at the end is often beneficial. And this, in fact, is the most common configuration that you're going to see for standard manufactured trusses. It's a modified Warren with a shallow uh, web member at the end. And uh, this is not exact. This is not a modified Warren. This is a Warren with a shallow web at the end. And the whole point of this is to have this shallow web member so that it will penetrate deep enough into this end bearing assembly to deliver its load to the top of the beam. In this case, we have a fairly wide flange. We have end bearing assemblies on the trusses coming in from each side. The trusses are not offset relative to each other. So uh, this end bearing assembly gets to rest on this half of the flange. The other one gets to rest on the other half of the flange and this piece comes to the center line of action of this top cord right over the center of that flange which is, which is the bearing surface for that end bearing assembly. And what allows you in a fairly shallow end bearing assembly to get this member all the way to the center line so that you have the proper working point for that connection. In order to do that, this has to come in at a shallower angle than this one would have. Okay, so here's a, uh, a new twist on the modified Warren. Here we have the W shape, which is the classic signature of a Warren uh, truss. Here we have a vertical going up to support the top cord of this truss or to support the roof also uh, and that's the classic member that we've been attributing to uh, that has led us to the term modified Warren but you'll notice in this case we also have verticals going down to the bottom cord so for example this vertical comes down to the bottom cord of that truss and the reason we have that in this particular situation is that we have not only large loads on the roof, this is a, a trust bridge at O'Hare Airport in Chicago, 
where they get a fair amount of snow. So we have large loads on the roof, but we also have a, a concrete floor here that weighs 40 or 50 pounds a square foot. And we have the live load of people on this bridge, which could possibly be in the neighborhood of 80 pounds a square foot under extreme circumstances. So we need to protect both the bottom cord and the top cord against the bending effects of all these loads that are delivered to those bottom cords. So we have the vertical here that goes up and supports the top cord and then this vertical uh, hangs the bottom cord off of this joint. This is a, another example of a Warren truss. Here we have the W like so and we have a vertical there supporting this beam in the floor and we have a vertical right here which supports uh, this beam in the roof. So verticals at all joints either dropping down to support the floor working in tension or rising up to support a beam in the roof and working in compression. This is not actually a structural truss at all. This is a piece of decoration, but it kind of shows the basic geometry. It also shows a very simple way of dealing with the joints, which is a simple rectangular plate. Normally you don't like having a point that sticks out like this, but because that point is along the line of this member, it actually gives you a dis additional weld distance and becomes a really excellent uh, kind of connector. So with the simplest kind of uh, sheared plates, we're able to make very elegant and effective joints in a truss like this. This is at RDU. This is the classic uh, clevises, steel cable um, adjustment mechanism for the uh, um, cable trusses in the roof. Uh, and this is a decorative element over one of the vendor's uh, shops. And again, as I say, it doesn't have a structural function, uh, but it's a very attractive and a wonderful illustration of how such a truss might be put together. Okay, so here we have the, modif the uh, basic Warren truss again. Um, and you'll notice one of the potential disadvantages is this is a very long compression cord member. So sometimes we would like to figure out a way to brace it more frequently. We've already mentioned the modified Warren truss as one way of uh, reducing that by putting a vertical strut here. Another way is to simply uh, compress the web pattern like an accordion so that instead of being the shape of triangle we have here, we can have triangles that are more isosceles like this with shorter cord members. Or we can take our basic Warren configuration and replicate it again. Normally we don't like to do this because we're introducing a bunch of additional joints where members either have to cross by each other in which case they're eccentric to each other, which introduces torsion and bending moments and other issues we don't, we'd like to not deal with. But there are some very elegant ways to make these crossover connections. So we're gonna talk about a few of those. This one is probably not the most elegant because what we've got is rectangular tubular members, which are offset relative to each other. And as I said, that creates torsion and moments at the joint connection joints. So here we got a member that might be working in compression. That member might be working in tension. And because they're offset relative to each other, they're tending to twist or torque that joint. Uh, and in this case, you see what a messy and complicated joint that is. But nonetheless, it works reasonably well and is one way of doing a truss like this. Here's another, which I happen to like better, and it's an older example. Um, here we have steel bars, which normally would buckle really easily under compression, but they've been trussed together 
um, to stabilize them at intermediate points and make them much more effective. Um, but what's been possible by keeping these thin and slab-like is we don't have great eccentricities where they cross by each other. And, and what eccentricities exist there can be compensated for by all these bracing elements which help keep those members in the proper shape. So by making them slab-like, we've made it possible for them to cross by each other without great eccentricity. And then using all this cross bracing, we're able to stabilize those fairly thin slab-like elements. This is another example. In this case, you'll notice this member in compression and that member in compression are both channels which gives them some stability and then they're also braced together with a bunch of cross bracing whereas the members going in this direction which are in tension are just slabs so they're not channels and they're not cross braced together to stabilize them so we see a very different articulation between this assembly which is in compression and that assembly in this particular bridge which is in tension. Unfortunately, of course, all the framing associated with the glass in the structure is making this very difficult for you to see all the structure clearly, but I hope it's getting across. So again, this is a channel. Here's a, a, a flange, the web. There's another flange down below. There's a channel here with a web, excuse me, a flange, the web on the backside and another flange. And then all these bracing elements are bracing those uh, channels against buckling under uh, the compressive load. And again, these bars, these steel bars that are flat, have been able to bypass these channels fairly easily because these flat bars don't have any great thickness to them. And in the end, they're not terribly eccentric where they interact with those channels. Here's an interesting structure. It's based on the same principle. We have bars in one direction acting in compression, bars in the other direction acting in tension. And what makes these bars work is all this cross bracing. At this point you see cross bracing in both directions, but if we pull back from this bridge we see something interesting. When we get out here far enough, those going in this direction which are in compression, are fully triangulated and braced, but those going in this direction are not triangulated because we're assured under the loading condition that these are always acting in tension. And these are always acting in compression. Out towards the middle under shifting load, we never know which of these is going to be acting in tension and which in compression. So we could have compression in this member under one load condition and then under another asymmetric load condition we might have compression in this member. So all through this sort of central zone we have full bracing in both directions but when we get near the end where we're sure that we only have tension in these members we do not fully brace them. Here's another example. Here um, the tension members are working are made out of steel and they're fairly thin and they occur in pairs. So there's an outer pair, excuse me, an outer tension member and an inner tension member and they work through a, a pin or a rod down here to transfer force to the compression member. And by the way, the compression member in this case is stocky and thick and made out of wood and the tension members are made out of steel bar um, and they're fairly slender and they bypass this compression member by running one on each side. So in doing that we avoid eccentricity at the joints because we have two tension members on the outside and a major compression member on the inside. It's, a, it's an amazingly elegant and beautiful structure which happens to have uh, wood top cords also where the wood is acting in compression 
so that's an acknowledgement that that's a very good way to use wood. Down below, it's intention. And by the way, I want to remind you that towards the center of the truss, we have the maximum tensile force in the bottom cord. It diminishes down and gets smaller. And you can almost either imagine changing the cross section to correspond to the size of this force, which might mean you take a round rod and change its diameter, or you can, you can have a whole series of elements that work in tension and are, that are very modular, and you can literally figure out a certain number that are needed there, a different number there, a different number there, and so forth. And you see that reflected on the bottom here, where we have a whole series of I bars. Here we only need one. There we need two and two and then three and three. And finally at the center, it looks like we need four of those or so. Um, some of you may be familiar with a piece of exercise equipment. In fact, there are multiple pieces of exercise equipment that have been developed with kind of I bar elements except in the case of the exercise equipment, they're made out of rubber, but you basically adjust the number of those rubber eye bars to change the resistance in the machine. But this was back in the 1800s, so this is amazing uh, technology and engineering for that period of time. And it allowed people to put bridges like this together fairly quickly because they'd have a kit of parts where they could adjust to the situation to figure out how many of these uh, slabs or eye bars they needed. And by the way, I remind you, it's hard to see, but for every eye bar on the outside here, there's an equal number of eye bars on the inside. So everything is symmetric around the center line. These compression members are at the center line. These tension diagonals are symmetric on each side of the center line and likewise the cord forces or cord members are symmetric so there'll be two here and then two on the inside um, that are absolutely symmetric to the center line of the plane of this truss. Sometimes we have trusses that are not braced very often laterally and in, when we have a situation like that, we'd like to choose cord members where the cord members in compression, we want to choose it to have a geometry that's more stable against buckling laterally or horizontally than it is vertically. And so if we were doing double angles, we just make this horizontal leg much longer, but that's not really a great way to do it because you're not getting very much material away from the neutral axis. So another way to do it is to take a wide flange and turn it horizontal. So this is a flange and that's a flange and the web is horizontal. Normally we put the web vertical when we want to use it as a beam to resist gravity force. But for such a truss where lateral stabilization of the top cord or the compression cord is a really crucial issue, this would be the geometry we would want to pick. We could also use a rectangular tube and lay it horizontal so that's its strong direction. So here's an example of such a structure. Here we have a series of roof slabs which are supported at uh, a node point of the truss there and another node point there. And in the meantime, if I trace this top cord, there's a node point up there that's not laterally stabilized. So this node point stabilized, that one stabilized, that one stabilized, the one up above here is stabilized, but that joint and that bottom joint are not stabilized. So this top cord, which is in compression, wants to buckle laterally up at this point, and this truss geometry, or the member geometry, was picked to help resist that. So here you see the wide flange laid on its side with the web horizontal, and the flange is vertical. And then these are the wide flange web members. And you'll notice they're cut on a miter. And in this case, the web doesn't even go all the way down. So the real connection between the uh, bottom cord and these webs 
is the welding along this line of the flange of the web members to the flange of the cord members. Uh, clearly that joint doesn't develop the full strength of the web members because the web member uh, webs of these wide flange elements are not, uh, do not go down and engage. This is typically not a problem though because most of the material is in the flanges, um, but also all these elements are limited somewhat by buckling, so we typically don't have to make an end connection that develops the full strength of the member. But this does have to be accounted for, and some of these members may be slightly oversized because the nature of this joint does not allow us to develop the full strength of that member. And so the size of the member is governed by the connection process here rather than what's happening out at the middle of the, of the structural element. In this case, by the way, we didn't want these webs to go all the way down because if they had been welded to the web of the wide flange in this bottom cord, then rain would have gotten into this troffer and it would have gotten trapped and caused uh, corrosion. So this allows us to run water down here. In some applications, by the way, this troffer on the top here is beneficial. It's a nice place to put electric lights, uh, strip lights along there, which then shine up towards the ceiling or shine on the uh, web members of the truss. Um, and it's a way of hiding and disguising the electric lights. It allows us to use a very inexpensive bare electric system with minimal optics and and do everything with reflected light off the structure in the ceiling, um, which can be very elegant but and, and very soothing and minimal glare uh, and very low first cost. We can also run electric wiring and things like this for interior applications. Um, this is a showing a similar kind of assembly that might be a little more clear. In this case, it's connected together with gusset plates and rivets. And here is the same geometry again. In this case, we have the wide flange elements laid horizontal, both on the top cord and the bottom cord, and the web members, which are made out of sections that have the same depth. So the, the flanges line up and can be welded together. Um, and in this case, they've also done this rigid frame action as a way of providing lateral stability. Again, I'll mention that any kind of planar truss has major issues with lateral stability. It's really weak in that direction. All of them have to be braced in one way or another. Uh, in this case, the bracing is this rigid frame lateral ladder that provides resistance to horizontal movement. A much more complicated joint is the following. Here the bottom cord uh, has been kept vertical with the vertical web. Um, and likewise, every single element here, it's the web of the wide flange is in a vertical plane. And now what we discover is there's all kinds of complex interactions that are occurring at this joint. So this joint is expressive, it's beautiful, but compared to the one we just talked about where we just make those miter cuts and we weld the flanges together, this is an immensely complicated joint and would almost never uh, be justified. And you might say, well, you want to keep this wide flange strong for gravity loads, but look at what they did here. This is the beam that's supporting that decking, and that beam is coming directly to this joint. So there's nothing apparent in this structure that would suggest that this wide flange needed to be set with its strong direction in the vertical direction. Literally, whoever decided to do this, they did it because they found the aesthetics of this joint appealing. But the joint cost a lot of money. 
Okay, so here are some uh, trusses on the end walls of Dulles Airport. Um, and I just mentioned this. This is an example of a Warren truss, which I think is quite beautiful. You'll notice they've done the shallow end detail here by bending this cord member. So this cord right here is a solid bar of steel, which has been bent at that point so that the material is continuous all around this path, um, but absolute minimal welding and joinery to produce a very elegant truss. Okay, so we'll return to this example again, just briefly to talk about joints. Um, this is a gusset plate, which has been cut in a circle. And by the way, it's not too hard to cut uh, circles using uh, torches, water cutters, or laser cutters. Um, there is, of course, cost associated with this, but in the case of this structure, I think they felt it was more elegant. Uh, we could have done this, or this could have been done with a simple rectangular plate, and the pointed part of that plate would have occurred internal to these tubes, so it wouldn't have been particularly disturbing to do that and it would have been more economical because then the plate could have been sheared. But what we have here is this plate is welded to the top flange of the wide flange bottom cord. So this is an external view. You see truss members inside of this fritted glass coming to a connection point there. And this crescent is welded to the center line of this beam right here. So there's, in essence, continuity between this plate and the web of this beam. And then we have an additional stiffener here, which uh, uh, strengthens that web and also strengthens this whole point for the connection of these cross members. Um, the key point here is uh, that's a continuous full penetration weld. This is a full penetration weld. These tubes are slotted. All three of these tubes are slotted and they slide down around this plate and then the weld goes the full length along there and the full length along there. Um, this is a splice connection in the bottom cord. This connects the flange, the bottom flange. There's one connecting the top flanges of this side and that side. And then this is the shear connection plate um, that transfers vertical forces between these two elements. Um, a kind of elegant point here is the following, where again, we're talking about joints. In the case of this, these are steel tubes that have been mashed on the ends and they are inserted up into a slot that's been cut in, in the uh, cord member. And then a pin has been inserted through the wood and through the ends of the two mashed steel tubes. Now, this pin cuts away a substantial amount of the um, cord member material. And I, I regret in this photograph, I can't show it to you fully, but one of the interesting things is near the end of the truss, the cord forces are not nearly as high as near the middle. And there's an, a beautiful synergism because near the end of the truss is where the maximum forces occur in the webs. So this pin has to have the highest diameter near the end of the truss in order to transfer the large forces out of these web members and into the, the cord member. But fortunately, the cord member can tolerate the cutting away of all that material because the cord member doesn't have much cord force in it at that point. And if you could see this whole truss, you would see these pins get progressively smaller. And by the time we get to the center of the truss, what was a half an inch or so near the end becomes like three sixteenths of an inch near the center of the truss. 
which is really nice because that's where the tension in the bottom cord is going to be the highest and you'd like for that pin to not be cutting away very much of that cord. But these are all things in conceptualizing a truss you really need to think about how the parts and pieces are fitted together and you need to look for these kinds of synergisms because if you have two bad trends reinforcing each other that probably means you don't have a good design but in this case we have a trend that the web members demand larger and larger pins near the end and the cord members can tolerate that because the cord members have smaller and smaller forces in them as you get near the end of the truss. This is uh, the Pompidou Museum and I don't know that I want to say very much except that all these are cast fittings and they're beautifully designed to mediate between the members that are making up these trusses. And here, by the way, you see that effect I mentioned earlier, where these two members, uh, which don't have much force here, but they have more force there, they've been tapered so that uh, when they come to this joint, they have this new diameter expressing that new function. And this is the image that I was hoping I had earlier, and so I'm glad I didn't miss it. Here we have a member coming along the member tapers before it crosses over this joint so that it has the strength to take the loads that are being transferred at that joint. So this member is working in compression. It's pushing that way. This one's working in tension. It's pulling that way. And the two of them are conspiring to throw substantially more force into this cord member than existed in this cord member. So this entire truss is like a force diagram um, that expresses how forces are being transferred through the system. This is an external view. And when we start, when we start talking about lateral stabilization, we're going to get into all sorts of interesting things here. Like, for example, this bipod, that bipod, and that one are helping to lace that truss to that one to create a giant uh, shear truss against lateral forces. And we have that occurring at every floor. So we're getting like a gigantic uh, shear wall here without fully filling, filling in every one of these bays. Another cool thing that's happening is these members out near the middle are assuring that any load tending to deflect one of these trusses will get transferred to the trusses below and the trusses above. So this uh, basically uh, all floors deliver all loads to all trusses and this helps smooth out statistical variations where you might have a really big load on one floor when there's a gathering there and it's nice to know that all the other trusses on all, all the other floors are helping out. What's really intriguing to me about this system though are these elements right here. This bipod at the end and that bipod. When this truss tends to deflect downward, that bipod tends to move that joint from there to the right. And likewise, when this end starts to slope, this point moves to the left. Meanwhile, under load, this top cord has been trying to stretch out and so it's trying to move this joint that way. And what happens is it keeps the bipod from moving and the bipod effectively lifts this point or holds this point up so the normal slope that would begin to develop at the end of the truss doesn't develop. In other words, this is like a fixed ended truss because of the action of this bipod and the action of that bipod, they are causing the ends of these trusses to stay horizontal or more nearly horizontal so there's less deflection. In essence, this webbing of these three that occur at every level are making this entire wall 
work like one enormously deep truss, but you don't read it that way. It doesn't have that many members. It doesn't block all the windows. Uh, and it produces a rather lovely uh, pattern where you tend to focus on the individual trusses that are occurring at each floor. And you don't fully realize that this is like one massive truss that runs the height of the building. It's a very, very elegant structure. And if you're ever in Paris, it's one of the things that I most strongly recommend that you go see. And of course, I realized this was not long after this building was built, but that's when I was in Paris on one occasion, my first visit there. And when I asked 10 Parisians what I should go see, this building was at the top of every person's list. And, and by the way, there's some spectacular stuff in Paris. So when you get Parisians to agree on something like that, it's a pretty amazing thing. Okay, so here we have uh, a structure which has wind load on all this, these walls and glass that's tending to push the structure in that direction. Because this structure is so long from one end to the other, it's several hundred feet, it's more than a football field, and the dimension of the structure across here is not very great. So this is a roof where we don't want to rely just on the diaphragm action of the decking. So you'll notice that the roof is trussed with this cross bracing. In essence, this is like that shifted uh, Warren truss where we have two Warren geometries that are shifted a half a bay relative to each other. Um, so here we have a W and here we have part of another, another W. Um, and that makes this entire roof like this really deep horizontal truss resisting the horizontal wind forces. This is just a somewhat closer view of that. And this shows some connection. So you'll see these square tubes which have uh, double plates welded on them. Those plates go on each side, very much like a clevis. They go on each side of this plate. And likewise, there's a similar connection here. So here's a, a plate that's full penetration welded to this vertical square tube. And then this square tube with these welded plate inserts slides on each side of that and is through bolted to get the truss action. So we've got this element going across and these elements. So we've got the modified Warren that's also shifted half a bay so that we have crossover elements uh, at the mid height, or in this case, it's not mid height, but mid distance. So we have this crossover occurring here and there where the web members are basically passing by each other or through each other. What I like about this welded connection, by the way, is they've come with these plates off the corner of the tube, which is the strong edge of the tube and represents a really good place to make this connection. When you weld a plate into the face of the square tube, you can warp that face, you can create stress concentrations in your weld, but when you come off a corner like this, you have one plate coming this way, the other plate in the other direction. And when you develop tension in this fin, it doesn't warp either one of those faces of the, of the uh, square vertical element. Um, and so that makes that a, a very simple but very effective kind of connection. Again, these are full penetration welds in order to make this plate work the way it needs to work. You also see here a rather crude geometry with these very heavy uh, square tubes. Um, and a similar detail to this one is occurring here where these elements engage a plate that becomes the mediator for this bolted connection. It's all very effective, very well worked out. Uh, but these trusses are so heavy-handed that um, 
you don't you don't feel like they're very elegant, but they definitely get the job done. That ends our second video on parallel chord truss geometries, fo focusing on the Warren configuration and the modified Warren configuration.